Buonasera a tutti and welcome to the Italian Culture Institute. Um, the series Italian Journeys of American Writers continues with a talk by the writer Benjamin Taylor uh, titled Capri Revisited and uh, uh, using the words of Benjamin, a few thoughts on the history of an inexhaustibly rich and beguiling ref refuge. And Benjamin Taylor is the author of a family memoir, The You and Cry at Our House. He has also published Proust, The Search, named Best Book of 2016 by Thomas Marlowe in the New York Times Book Review. Naples Declared, that is uh, related to the topic of tonight, A Walk Around the Bay, named Best Book of 2012 by Judith Thurman in The New Yorker, and the two award-winning novels, Tales Out of School and The Book of Getting Even. He previously edited Soul Bellow Letters, named a Best Book of 2010 by Michiko Kakutani in The New York Times and Jonathan Yearly in The Washington Post, and Soul Bellow, there is simply too much to think about collected non-fiction. A faculty member of the New School's Graduate School of Writing, Taylor also teaches at the Graduate Writing Division of the School of Arts at Columbia University. A past fellow and current trustee of the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation is as recently being nominated president of the Edward L.B. Foundation. So please welcome Benjamin Taylor. Thank you, Giorgio, very much. I thought I would speak tonight about uh, the range of people who have uh, called Capri home. And it, it's a group that uh, uh, include the illustrious, uh, uh, the uh, immensely talented, the modestly talented, and also the, the downright weird. Uh, 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 and uh, it seems to have been a magnet from antiquity uh, for uh, uh, strong personalities. Uh, uh, so uh, I thought I'd just look at a few of them uh, with you this evening. A 19th century resident of Capri, Colonel John Clay McCowan, likened the island to an old boot. Turn the map east side down and you'll see what he meant. The shape of an old cavalier's boot, he said, and nature in a lavish mood has given it even a spur. Like many who've called Capri home, J.C. McCowan sounds more made up than real. Scion of a slave-owning Louisiana family, a veteran who had fought by the side of Robert E. Lee, he was so disgusted with the outcome of the war between the states, specifically with the loss of his family's chattel wealth, that he left America for Europe. A decade later, having qualified as a physician in Germany, he ventured to Capri on holiday and fell as so many others have, uh, irretrievably in love with the place. It is a familiar story among the foreign colony from antiquity to the present. Octavianus, not yet Caesar Augustus, first of many a sacred monster to attach himself to the island, in 29 BC traded Ischia, a possession nearly five times larger, for Capri. Upon his first arrival, Suetonius reports, a withered holm oak had miraculously put forth new growth, convincing the emperor that here was the great good place. He returned frequently throughout his reign. His collection of skeletal remains purporting to be prehistoric beasts, along with gigantic weaponry and bones believed to belong to the mythic Teleboi, was established here the prototype of every subsequent museum of natural history. In the summer of the year 14, nearer to death than he knew, Augustus sought repose and, amuse, uh, and uh, repose and amusement among the natives, ordering Greeks to wear the toga and speak in Latin, and Romans to put on the chiton and speak in Greek. On the way back to Rome a few days later, he fell ill and died at Nola, north of Naples. An epoch was marked. His stepson Tiberius assumed power, 
and Capri entered upon the most famous phase of its history. Of Tiberius, everybody knows the alleged infamies. If we are to believe his great detractors, Tacitus, and especially Suetonius, no sexual cruelty was beyond him. By their account, he favored the island chiefly as a hideaway in which to indulge his myriad perversions. Boys and girls raped, tortured, and thrown to their deaths from the heights of Villiovis, largest of the 12 palaces on the island, and so on. Gilles de Ray, who in the 15th century murdered perhaps as many as 800 French children, said his inspiration had been Suetonius's life of Tiberius. The whole truth about Rome's second emperor, Norman Douglas used to say, is in papyri locked beneath the lava of Herculaneum, awaiting further excavations for which no one should hold his breath. Meanwhile, scholars of our own times have not taken seriously the fiendish depictions of Tacitus and Suetonius, who wrote their chronicles a few generations after Tiberius and were fiercely anti-Julio-Claudian. It is as if the unquestionable ghastliness of some of his successors, Gaius Caligula, Nero, Domitian, had bled back onto Tiberius' own reputation, uh, as onto that of his mother, Livia. But with all due respect to Robert Graves, the great exception among modern skeptics here, evidence for Tiberius' depravity appears no stronger than the traditional claims for Livia's arch criminality. It all made good reading in I Claudius, but uh, uh, it's very far from the historical truth. The real Tiberius was an exemplary soldier and a very able, if doer, and anti-charismatic ruler who seems to have come to Capri in his 60s, not for debauchery, but to escape the eternal Roman infighting. No vacation spot as it had been for Augustus. The island was instead his home, year in and year out. For more than a decade, the empire was administered from here. The semaphore and heliograph by day, fire signals by night, and a continuous traffic of envoys up and down the coast sustained the flow of information. It was from here that Tiberius ordered the death of Sejanus, having learned of the Praetorian prefect's ambitions against him. Colonel McCowan, perhaps a bit of a Roman emperor at heart, certainly every inch an old Louisiana bourbon, established himself, as had Augustus and Tiberius, in residences around the island. He carried a bullwhip, employing it as liberally on Caprese as if they were his slaves back home. Afterward, he'd munificently send round food to those he had whipped. To be fair, McCowan did also gain their affection as a dispenser of treatment and medicines at no charge a doctor, as I say. And one is even less willing to hate the man after reading his monograph on Caffrey, the first work of its kind, printed at Naples in 1884 by compositors who knew not a word of English they were setting, the English they were setting, and who blundered on nearly every page. It is a book collector's rarity. On paper so acidic, you destroy the pages as you turn them. The original owner of my copy whose name I can't make out, added May 1887, Capri, beneath his or her signature. I keep it in a box as the binding has given way and the pages are chipped and broken. The old anti-emancipationist loved every ruin and cove. His unmistakable Pompeii Red House up at Anna Capri, a Moorish delight elaborated around a 16th century Aragonese watchtower from back when Capri kept the lookout for Corsairs, is today a higgledy-piggledy, unvisited museum housing the Neolithic axe hells and jadeite knives and other things the colonel unearthed. A word he caused to be incised into the facade, Apragopoli, Apragopoli, city of Doolittles, had evidently been Caesar Augustus's nickname for the island. Having little to do myself, I venture up there. Casa Rosa, as it is called, is ideal in the sleepy afternoon for illicit assignations. And this is 
exactly what I believe I blundered into. Um, the man passes me black looks and his much younger lady averts her face. I move on to the next room. Nothing natural or human failed to win McCowan's curiosity. He was, like Norman Douglas a generation later, one of those inspired amateurs who honored the island with their intellectual insatiability, turning over every rock, venturing up every crag, entering every cave, who, seeing all there is to see, fret that they cannot enter Grotta Oscura too, sealed up in the early 1800s in a landslide. There was no butcher, McCowan reports, and beef could be obtained only when a cow had the misfortune to fall over a precipice, whereupon a trumpet call announced meat for sale in the Piazzetta. He is witty on the 2,500-year-old rivalry between the lower town, Capri, and the upper town, Anna Capri, a case of Freud's narcissism of small differences, if ever there was one. The people of Anna Capri consider the heir of Capri woefully deleterious to all moral principle and wonder how an honest stranger can remain any length of time among such corrupted and evil specimens of humanity. There is a local term of abuse unmentioned by McCowan, chamiello, referring to a boy from the upper town who's been duped into marrying a girl from the lower town. And the colonel is suddenly moving when he salutes the forbearance and strength of the island's women, uh, alone much of the year while their husbands fished far out at sea for coral. Most of the heavy labor on land was accomplished by women negotiating the Scala Fenicia that zigzags up the face of Monte Solaro. All the houses of Capri and Anna Capri, says McCowan, have been carried to their present sites on the heads of women. He must have made that journey himself a thousand times and grasped the arduousness of what was but a day's work for those indomitable Capriote wives. I myself recommend descent of the Phoenician stairway to only the vigorous and the upward climb to no one, having seen my life pass before my eyes the one time I tried it. All told, the Colonel seems a decent man despite himself, generous with his medical expertise, loyal to the local women he lived with and the natural children they presented him with. But his end, it is said, was ignominious. Back in Louisiana in the summer of 1901, McCowan felt, felt a bloviating nostalgically. It, had, it was traditionally said in a bar about slavery times, whereupon a former slave shot him to death. Uh, this turns out to be apocryphal. Uh, he was in a land dispute with a man uh, up near Baton Rouge uh, and, and died of gunshot wounds in the course of this dispute. Um, descendants of his live on uh, in Capri to this day. The Scala Phoenicia, not Phoenician at all, in fact, demonstrably Greco-Roman, has been built repeatedly over the centuries Prior to the construction of the Anna Capri Highway, it was, apart from a death-defying path called the Passacielo, the upper town's only link to the lower. This ancient stairway has its modern counterpart in Via Crop, a narrow pedestrian route from the Gardens of Augustus down to Marina Piccola. After being closed for decades, the renovated Via Crop reopened in June 2008. Roberto Pane, architectural historian, preservationist, and toughest critic of ill-considered building and ill-judged restoration on the Bay, called the Krupp Road a work of art. And if work of art means a thing inexhaustible to contemplation, then work of art it is. Instead of zigzagging rigidly down the Castiglione cliffside, it obliges irregularities in the living rock. You sense the rise and dips along the narrow route as you descend. The angle of vision is new at each hairpin turn. The Krupp's low tufa parapet is of rounded blocks and a mortal temptation to young daredevils who try to walk it tightrope wise. Beauty and danger have in fact kept close company on this face of the Castiglione for more than a century 
ever since the brief tragic phosphorescence of Fritz Krupp, who built the wondrous road as sole, if reluctant, heir to his father's munitions industry, Friedrich Alfred Krupp commanded the largest private fortune in Germany, greater even than that of Kaiser Wilhelm II. Scholarly, fat, short-sighted, and asthmatic, Fritz had been the family embarrassment. This disapproval did not impede him from extraordinary success at the armaments trade once he turned himself to it. He earned a seat on the Kaiser's Privy Council. A maritime biologist by avocation, Fritz came to the Bay in 1898 at the invitation of Dr. Anton Dorn, founding head of the Naples Aquarium, at that time the world's finest collection of specimens. Having outfitted a pair of yachts with the latest marine research equipment, Krupp showed up minus his wife and two daughters and checked into the Quisizana, the here one gets healthy, uh, leading hotel of Capri from that day to this, an entire floor of which was let to him and his retinue. The name of the lodgings alone must have made a strong appeal. His asthma was worsening and doctors back at Essen had recommended a Mediterranean sojourn. In his romantic eyes, Norman Douglas observed, the inhabitants of Capri were children of nature, one and all of them. The truth was and is a lot more equivocal than Krupp's romantic eyes saw. When a generous man of unlimited means arrives in such an insular place, handing out gold coins at the quayside, nothing is afterward the same. Thus it was at Capri, Fritz's preference for the Quisizana over the competing hostelry fixed, fed existing feuds. In general, those, were lives, uh, those whose lives were enriched by the magnet worshipped him as a new Caesar. Those he not patronized increasingly wished him harm. Without knowing it, Krupp balkanized Capri into pro and anti-Krupp camps. In 1901, in a gesture of gratitude for Capriot hospitality, he purchased a parcel of land adjacent to the Carthusian monastery and terraced and planted it as a Giardino Publico, today's Gardens of Augustus. Below, the Krupp Road to the Little Marina was simultaneously constructed. Secreted halfway down was the Grotto of Brother Felice, originally home to an early 15th century hermit, industrious and mathematically gifted, who over the course of 30 years had delved a pair of chambers from the rock face. Afterward, monastic dormitories and later a prison the Grotta di Fra Felice had been abandoned, and it would seem forgotten, till Krupp adorned the exterior with ambulatories and terraces and pergolas, and within fashioned a dining room, a kitchen, and lavatories, all of it with a view to evenings reviving the ancient imperial splendors and recreations. These latter seem to have been Fritz's undoing. Among the southern charms he'd hearkened to was the available beauty of Capri's boys and young men. He had come from a country where homosexuality was, as in Great Britain, against the law and punished by prison at hard labor. His belated realization of his own nature and of his freedom in Italy to act on it proved overwhelming. At Krupp's splendidly refurb refurbished Grotta di Fra Felice, according to one historian of these murky goings on, handsome young Caprese submitted, I'm quoting now, submitted to sophisticated caresses from him. While three violinists played, an orgasm was celebrated by skyrockets. <laughs> Ludicrous, yes, and more than a little reckless, inasmuch as Fritz had the festivities photographed. Images found their way to a local pornographer whose clientele were quick to observe that some of Krupp's acolytes fell short of the age of consent. By stages, the press, first in Naples, then in Rome, finally in Germany, grew bolder in exposés of these goings-on. La Propaganda, a leftist Neapolitan daily, ran a series detailing how this exploiter of the proletariat enjoyed himself. 
in Rome, Avanti took up the hue and cry, as did Forwerts in Berlin. Back at Essen, Krupp sued the latter paper for libel. But when it became clear that the Kaiser would not come to his defense, he seems to have lost heart. Official reports attributed his death to an aortal aneurysm, but few have ever doubted that on the afternoon of November 22, 1902, Sina Excellenz Herr Friedrich Alfred Krupp took his own life. After an espresso this morning uh, in the Piazzetta, where all of Capri foregathers, Europe's best drawing room, people call it, uh, I head up via Roma, then down via Provinciale Marina Grande, greeted by Salve, stopping to stop, talk to an occasional cat or dog, wondering at the robust elderly folk who daily toil up and down these paths. I'm on what is for me an inevitable mission. The Cimitero Acatolico draws me. <clears throat> Here you may do homage to the gamut of Anglo-American and other expatriates who took their pleasures here, quarreled operatically, loved, envied, hated, desired, used, and betrayed one another. Death has folded them in a common party, as the poet says. In this non-Catholic ground, alongside the moderately to greatly gifted, rest assorted hangers-on of Capri life, spongers, climbers, holy fools, artistic phonies, Nazi propagandists, and not least, enabling the show, provisioning it, the very rich who are always with us. Take the Mrs. Wolcott Perry over by the North Wall, side by side in their choice location. Nothing but the best for Sadie Wolcott and Kate Perry, cousins propelled by real estate back in Iowa. To solemnize the bond, they conjoined their surnames and in Vestal Fire, Compton Mackenzie's delicious, nasty satire of the social and sexual antics of Capri. They turn up as Virginia and Mamie Pepworth Norton. The Lucullen hospitality of these two was counted among the wonders of the Bay. From Villa Torricella, social omphalos of the island in the early years of the last century, and with its Moorish minaret and tower, still the most salient structure above Marina Grande, they ruled the roost, ushering into or banishing from the little universe of island society whomever they chose, run afoul of the Mrs. Wolcott Perry, and woe betide you. There, along the wall, in a rather sunken grave, lies Jacques Dattlesworth Fersen, the pretty, foppish, lightweight, championed by Kate and Sadie as if he were a Valerie or a Rilke. Having done time in France for inciting a minor to debauchery, Fersen arrived in Capri in 1904, elevated himself from baron to count, checked into the Cuisizana, the inevitable Cuisizana, and consecrated his large hereditary income to construction of a villa perched at the northeastern precipice of the island. Sanctuary of love and sorrow, as the facade announces in Latin. Villa Lysis was the scene of Fersen's attempts at literary creation and of his idolization of an out for the main chance Roman construction worker named Nino Cesarini. <coughs> the pathetic finale came in 1923 when Fersen mixed himself a lethal cocktail of wine and cocaine, the latter of which he'd been addicted to for years. I do not recommend taking anyone you love up the winding path to Villa Lysis, the only thing of lasting interest that Fersen produced. I, I've tried to read his poems. Uh, it is a monument to folly and humiliation and sanctuary of delusion would be a truer motto to have set above the door. Over there, among these big spenders, lies poor John Ellingham Brooks, came for lunch and stayed for life, as he liked <laughs> to tell people. Having arrived in 1895, he remained till his lonely death in 1929. <clears throat> Handsome, Cambridge educated, bursting with the gospel of an empty aestheticism. He'd been the first lover of W. Somerset Maugham, in so many respects his polar opposite, 
Neither industrious nor skillful nor shrewd, Brooks was one of those would-be writers who indefinitely postponed. He didn't so much want to write as to already have written. How odd he must have been by his younger friends, Mom and E.F. Benson, so prolific and successful. The proximity to their industry and renown seems to have sufficed. It often does for would-be writers. A dreary and familiar pattern. Uh, as for what Mom made of Brooks, we have the following. No one could be meaner than Somerset Maugham when he got going. He can discover nothing for himself. He intends to write, but for that he has neither energy, imagination, nor will. He has a craving for admiration. He is weak, vain, and profoundly selfish. Brooks's brief marriage to the painter, Romaine Goddard, thereafter famous as Romaine Brooks, resulted in an annuity of 300 pounds on condition that she never have to set eyes on him again. <laughs> Money that enabled him to go in with Mom and Benson on the lease of Villa Cercola uh, at the eastern edge of Capri Town. The two writers came and went. Brooks stayed, feeding the pets, making stabs at translation, playing the piano. In lieu of Cave Canem, the warning carved elegantly into the threshold of Villa Cercola reads Cave Hominem. Uh, and there was reason for the rest of the Anglo-American colony to beware the man. He'd been a tape recorder all these years, and over the course of many long evenings, told Compton Mackenzie the stories that would constitute Vestal Fire. Thus, his creativity was satisfied. It is touching that a man who published nothing should have tagged along with the likes of Mom, Benson, and Mackenzie, men who brought out books by the bushel. Mom captured Brooks's exceptionally pathetic last years on the island in a heartless short story called The Lotus Eater, in which a perfectly ordinary man dedicated to nothing but his pleasure declines from bohemianism to rancid poverty. The Lotus Eater ends his days as a mad scarecrow who darts from olive tree to olive tree. Brooks didn't actually go mad, but he did grow more and more spectral dying alone of untreated cancer in a one-room shack on the island. This seems to have pleased Mom very much. How anybody, so many years later, could harbor such hatred for a first love, I find hard to grasp. Two rows away from Brooks lies Viet Harlan, director of the preeminent Nazi propaganda film, Jud Seuss. But enough about the disagreeable, the pathetic, and the wicked. Over here is the distinguished looking grave of Gracie Fields, Dame Gracie as she became not long before her death. In war and out, she consoled and delighted millions with her no-nonsense Lancashire manner and wonderful renditions of Sally, wish me luck as you wave me goodbye, and the biggest aspidistra in the world, angels guard thee, Christopher Robin is saying his prayers, not to mention the Isle of Capri. She lived here for decades greatly loved. But what I've come for this morning is to visit that tomb down there, the one inscribed Omnes Eodem Kojimur, a tag from Horace meaning in loose translation, where all must gather. The least illusory, least sentimental epitaph on record. It was chosen by the great man who sleeps beneath it, a denizen of antiquity nobly, sometimes hilariously displaced into the 19th and 20th centuries. Norman Douglas, quoted several times already, uh, simultaneously Epicurean and Stoic, he summed up the Hellenistic excellences. Aristocratic by birth and rearing, he could as readily live rough as in style and hadn't the ghost of a care for respectability or convention. If there was an amorality to him that he couldn't stay away from prepubescent boys, uh, there, were also a grand, there was also a grand gift for friendship with those who'd been in his bed, as well as those who hadn't. Graham Greene revered Douglas and sought during seasonal sojourns at Capri to adopt his attitude to life, find everything useful and nothing indispensable, find everything wonderful and nothing miraculous. They were an unlikely pair, Douglas, atheist, homosexual, 
poor and madly interested in everything to do with the Neapolitan Bay. Green, Catholic, consecrated to women, rich, and indifferent to the Bay, where he came only to write his books. Norman Douglas fathered forth the sensibility of English travel writing. Figures such as Robert Byron, Peter Fleming, Norman Lewis, Patrick Lee Fermor, James and afterward Jan Morris, Bruce Chapwin, Colin Thubron, and Pico Iyer are his progeny. Bright-heartedness, fanatical curiosity, and flying wit are the shared talismans, along with willingness to be a slave of the journey's emotions, as Robert Byron put it. These powers they inherit from the author of Old Calabria, Siren Land, and Alone. Edward Hutton, another of Douglas's inheritors, if now a forgotten one, said that Uncle Norman much preferred fact to emotion. I would say rather that it was the accurate emotions for flora, fauna, places, and people, the genii of nature and of history deciphered that drew him. On his first visit, he climbed one of the Ferraglioni, steep crags standing offshore, in search of the blue lizard that lives only there, and netted a specimen. He scoured every square foot of Monte San Costanzo, looking in vain for a trace of the Doric temple to <coughs> Athena, known to have stood there in remote antiquity. He loved this bay as learnedly and athletically as anyone before or since, feeling that here, if anywhere, was the just proportion between what nature has made and humankind has added. And it loved him back in full measure. In her memoir, The Heart to Artemis, Breyer, a pen name of Annie Ellerman, describes his disembarkation at Capri's Marina Grande after an absence of eight years. The news of his arrival spread from mouth to mouth. I have never seen a political leader enjoy so great a triumph. Men offered him wine. Women with babies in their arms rushed up so that he might touch them. The children brought him flowers. I slipped away as he walked through the crowd of several hundred people, shouting jokes in ribald Italian, kissing equally the small boys and girls, and patting the babies as if they were kittens. The Signore had deigned to return to his kingdom, and I am sure that they believed that the crops would be abundant and the cisterns full of water as the result. I try to imagine any American or British writer today of whatever eminence, being treated anywhere as well, but cannot. Douglas deserved it and more for having understood something profound about the Italian South and having embodied it in his vivid books, eternal paganism subsisting beneath the Christianity. The mystery cult of Mithras, perhaps of Zoroastrian origin, into which men and only men were inducted was brought to Rome from the east by returning soldiery. Its archaeological evidences have been found beneath a number of Rome's paleo-Christian churches, San Clemente, uh, Santa Priscia, and others, and it particularly appealed to Douglas for its obvious isomorphisms with Christianity, the competing oriental dispensation that finally stamped it out. Mithraism included baptism, sacramental bread and wine, renunciation of the old life for the new, martyrology, final judgment. A canny copycat, primitive Christianity, appropriated these things from its male-only competitor, much as it took from the worship, a worship of Sibylle, great mother goddess of Asia Minor, embodiment of fertility, and venerated primarily by women, the washing away of sin and the promise of new life with not water but blood in the Sibylian rite, pouring down onto the head of the neophyte when a sacrificial bull was slaughtered. Mithras is the name for the nourishment of the sun, and Sibylle for the endlessly fertile renewals of earth and mother. Mithras, like Christ, is the light of the world, says Douglas, and Sibylle, his whilom associate, is the Madonna, or Gran Madre di Dio the magna mater of old, who was worshipped both at Capri and Sorrento.
that's Douglas writing. So whatever it thought it was doing, Christianity, in fact, put new wine into old bottles. The light of the world had been Mithras, as the mother of God was Sibylle. Two images, of course, are everywhere you look on the bay. The one, a young god hanging on a cross. The other, a mother goddess with a babe in arms. Among his great contributions, Douglas understood the backward abysm in this iconography, grasped the exquisite persistence of pagan earthbound emotions among his beloved Southerners. He spent the last days of his life on Monte Toro, a forest hill ringed in terraces on Capri. Uh, these are uh, home to um, many of the prettiest houses. It was in one of these, owned by his friend Kenneth McPherson, that Norman Douglas, incurably ill, uh, took a lethal dose of drugs in February of 1952. God be with you, my dears. Or, you keep the old bugger. I shan't be wanting him, were his last volitional words. But as he lay comatose, Uncle Norman uttered the word love three times. Once, I like to think, for those who'd been good to him, once for himself, and once for the vanished realms of Capri carried within. Well, that cast of characters will do. Thank you. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Uh, Martha. Yes. Martha Cooley. Um, that was great. Uh, it, it, a rather tonic uh, experience listening to that. It sort of cleanses the, the romantic notions when one encounters so much debauchery. But I'm also wondering about Curzio Malaparte and what you can say about his house and, and his presence. Yes, I, um, I, left him out. He, uh, I left him out of this talk. Uh, uh, um, he, of course, is another of the sacred monsters. Uh, the more you get to know about that man, the more there is to dislike. He was, he was, he was a, a fascist when it was convenient to be, and then uh, a, um, Stalinist when it was convenient to be, then Maoist when it was convenient to be. When he found out he was uh, dying of terminal cancer, he became devoutly Roman Catholic. <laughs> uh, he was... Uh, greatly gifted, and uh, some people like Casa uh, Comeme, uh, his house, more, more than I do. In any case, he left that house to the People's Republic of China, and they didn't know what, what to do with it. His it is now reverted to his descendants, and I, I didn't know, I, I, I don't know anyone who's ever been inside it. You can see the inside of it in a movie, uh, Contempt by, by uh, Godard. I asked Shirley Hazard if she'd ever been inside it. She said, I wouldn't set foot in such a place. She had a particular loathing for uh, Malaparte and was particularly proud of Gr Graham Greene for having rejected the Malaparte Prize, which is awarded on the island uh, every, every few years, uh, when asked w why he ever had rejected the Malaparte Prize. He said, because of Curzio Malaparte. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much. Now, you, you speak uh, about the uh, Capri of other people now, but which, which is your Capri? Uh, well, I'm a less colorful personality than, <laughs> than these others. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I, never, I never made it 
my home, and I, I hope I certainly don't fit into the category of sacred monster, or uh, I hope I don't fit into the category of monster either, ever. Um, um, but I, uh, I, I would like to salute my late friend Shirley Hazard, uh, who really was one of these uh, extravagant denizens of the island, and uh, who introduced me to it. I, I wouldn't know what I, I wouldn't have known how to begin uh, uh, without her. Uh, I was just back there after an absence of eight years last summer, and uh, uh, one thing I noticed is that it's a little harder now to labor up and down those paths. It's a very rocky crag, you know, uh, and um, um, I, I guess I, maybe I'm getting a little older. I'm just the age Tiberius was when he retreated to the island. Uh, Antonio. Have you heard about the Scuola di Capri, uh, there's a, a this strange uh, uh, gathering of uh, uh, Russian revolutionary people. Yes. Uh, in, in the early uh, 20th century, Capri. And, uh, Gorky was there, and yeah, Lenin. Lenin, Lenin, Lenin was there too. Yeah. Yes, there's a there's a. It's so strange. I, uh, 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 and uh, people. Um, Nostalgists for Bolshevism still make pilgrimage to, to, uh, to the house that has a plaque on it. Yes, exactly. I did that. You did that. <laughs> <laughs> Not nostalgically. Yes. So what do you think, what do you think it is about copy that attracted these sorts of people? I mean, there, besides its physical <clears throat> beauty, there's a lot of other places in the world that you um, know, are so uh, picturesque. I think it, it, it feels uniquely like a refuge uh, 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 to people for the same reasons that it felt that way to Tiberius, because it, is, it has sheer rock face all around with only two natural harbors, Marina Piccola and Marina Grande. Uh, and that's why Tiberius uh, thought it was safe. I think uh, uh, other people ha have uh, found it uh, safe because uh, it can feel so far from the rest of the world. Uh, it really feels a long way from Naples. Uh, 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 I imagined when I was first getting there, it was just a jaunt, but it's, it's really an hour on, uh, on the water. So it's the ultimate escape, in a way. Uh, I think people found it the ultimate escape. And uh, 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 people like Ferson tended to go there after they, they'd had bad trouble in, in, in wherever it was they came from. <laughs> or... Uh, 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 in the case of Krupp, to indulge uh, uh, what couldn't be indulged at home. He's a, he's a poignant figure. I don't think he had any idea he was homosexual until he got to, uh, to Capri. <laughs> Capri was a great teacher. It's, it's always been. Well, again, my thanks. <laughs> <laughs>